All right, hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the stream where we implement an entire game, or in this case, an entire lighting system from scratch. Uh, and we are kind of getting close to having good lighting solution, I think, actually. It's been a, a bit of a long road, but, you know, it's converging on what I wanted. Now, we, today, pretty much our job is to get some debug stuff working. Uh, drawing some debug stuff in the lighting solution so that we can uh, converge on good lighting, right? Uh, right now, I think we're mostly set up for doing the lighting that I want, uh, but I think we've got a lot of bugs in there, and we just have tuning to do as well, even if we didn't have bugs. Uh, so we kind of have to go through and actually, like, do that work. We also did the beginnings... Um, uh, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what how far we got, but we did the beginnings last week, of the other part of it, which is sending down lighting information separately from rendering information, which again is also crucial because one of the things that we need to be able to do, since we are a two and a half D game with mixed, we are like mixed 3D, 2D, uh, we need to be able to replace our sprite cards with actual 3D geometry that can catch light. Just simple things like a cube or a sphere or something like this that can catch light. Uh, and so we really want to be able to, to uh, keep that in mind as we're, um, as we're sort of going. And we did part of that work uh, last week. We, we did the part where we can uh, put in arbitrary lighting samples per surface. Uh, so that's half of it, which is saying where we want the light to be collected. We need the other half of it now, which is let's say where we want our blockers to be. Uh, we wanna do that in a separate stream from our actual geometry that gets rendered. So that's really all we have to do. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, today's day 417. So if you're starting with source code from day 416, you should be able to follow along uh, directly with where I am. And I'm gonna go ahead here and uh, open up. Well, I'm gonna wait a while for Visual Studio to open up. It's thinking about it, it's working real hard. There it goes. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, load up our project and build it. Okay. Uh, so now I'm running, and uh, we actually found, oddly enough, that the lighting solution runs so quickly at the moment um, that we can even run it CPU side. Uh, now, it's very flickery, of course, because it's completely stochastically sampled and we haven't tuned it at all. Um, but, you know, even just looking at this, uh, what, what I kind of realized, you know, after we're going to have to do work, obviously, to get our lighting solution um, to be nicer. Uh, and that's what we're doing the debug for today because I think we've got some problems in there. But as we sort those problems out, one of the interesting things that you notice about it is it's running so fast right now that it even runs 60 frames a second almost on the CPU side, even even as unoptimized, right? It's not even, it, we, we didn't even do multi-threaded or SIMD. It runs uh, just fine this way on the small scene. Uh, as we improve that, that means I think we're in good shape for it. It already looks pretty good to me. Like, uh, if we, you imagine doing some temporal filtering on that flicker, uh, you know, this is really close to usable. So that was a pretty big win uh, for us. And I'm pretty excited about that because I think it's going to mean that we will converge on a really nice lighting solution here that we can actually use that we don't have to stress too hard about because it's like way too slow or something. So on certainly on modern machines, I think we'll be able to turn on full lighting, you know, with global illumination like we have here. Uh, and it'll be pretty good. Now, we're not out of the woods yet. Like I said, there's still a, a ways to go to make everything nice and clean and not flickery and higher lighting quality and blah, blah, blah. So we got a bunch of stuff to do, but this is just very promising, right? And it is already capturing most of the light things we want. You can see that there's a bounce lighting happening there. These tiles are getting the blue light reflected off of these reflectors. We're getting the shadowing that we want. So over here, we don't have um, uh, any of that sort of uh, light coming in. And again, we're not trying to do an accurate lighting solution here. We're just trying to add character to our scenes by having some nice global illumination in there uh, so that you can have like stuff when like a projectile goes, you get some nice things going. And I don't care if the lighting is too blocky because the game is a block, you know, it's built out of these little blocks that you're hopping around on. And it's supposed to reinforce the blocky feel. It's supposed to be, it's not Minecraft or anything, but it's fairly blocky in terms of the art style. So I don't need these to be smooth anyway. So I don't care how smooth we get those. I just wanna make sure we get some more smoothness in the actual lighting samples here that I'm not seeing. I think that's because of bugs that we have in how we're distributing the light and tuning we need to do there. Because again, we 
uh, are doing sort of a little bit new stuff now that we haven't debugged. So everything is looking pretty good to me. I'm pretty happy with where this is going. Uh, I do think we will probably need to make a larger scene. Also, we could slow things down a bit later to make a larger scene. Uh, and then as so as we do optimizations, we have something that's really slow to work on. Um, what I'll do is I'll just turn up the generator so we generate like a you know a big set of rooms so that we can test you know doing some of that. Uh, stuff a little bit more dynamically uh, but you know otherwise I think we're pretty good and really the main things that I want to do like I said is I really want to get um, that uh, uh, I want to get replacement geometry for like the trees and the hero sprite those sorts of things um, with the hero sprites turned off right now but when we turn it back on it'll be this big flat card here and that's no good uh, so we want replacement geometry the trees and hero sprite uh, we want to get the lighting tuned and uh, and then I think we're in good shape to do just like uh, put it down on the GPU or multi I don't know, maybe multi-threaded on the CPU is the right way to go. I, it could be. I mean, uh, I don't think it is. I think we want that done on the GPU, but you never know. It's hard to say. Lighting is the kind of thing that does a lot of uh, random geometry access. And, you know, sometimes it's just not uh, the kind of thing that GPUs like. And so I don't really know. That'll be an, that'll be a really interesting thing when it comes, when we get one that we're like happy with, it'll be pretty interesting to go, okay, what's the, um, you know, what's the right way to make this fast? And, and I'm not sure. So we'll have to see when we have the finished version uh, what what feels like the right way to go. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the render group here. And, and again, what I'm kind of looking at here is, if I remember correctly from where we left off last week, um, and maybe some of you remember better than I do, because of course I program all week on a completely different code base on completely different things. So sometimes it falls out of the, the mental cache. Uh, but if I remember correctly, what we're doing is, you know, we've got this uh, these extractors here instead of specifying uh, vertices uh, separately, what we did is we actually just used the same extractor and placed the points in the same places we were placing them before. We reduced the subdivision a little bit because we were just doing four points per uh, quad. We may up that in the future. You know, again, the idea is that you can specify these separately. So, you know, the generator as it generates the world can actually be dynamically deciding where to put these sample points, which is great um, because it means we have a lot of freedom uh, to sort of micromanage the lighting, which is what I wanted because, you know, lighting, like I said, lighting is something we just don't have great solutions for yet. So everything's always a hack. Uh, that's why you see all these ridiculous things like screen space, ambient occlusion, and all this nutso stuff going on. It's because there is no perfect solution to lighting. Real-time ray tracing, distributed ray tracing is the only solution we have uh, that we know about that would be like a full lighting solution. And it's just not, it's not feasible. It's not fast enough, right? Uh, so we're always doing a little bit of hacking and that's just something that is good to remember when you're designing a lighting scheme, being able to put in points where you can hack at it, uh, places where you can special case things, places where you can manually specify it, places where it need improvement. All that sort of stuff can be really helpful because you know you're not going to get a perfect solution. You just know that going into it, so don't expect it. Don't expect to get there, right? So designing in a little bit of flex is good. So, okay, here we go. Uh, we got our X7 and our Y sub uh, here. We're subsampling the lights. We're putting in uh, these points that we're going to be uh, working with. And what we know is there are four points per uh, surface we sent down. That It's hard-coded right now to, to generate that amount. So what we should be seeing, and the reason I say I want to move very quickly to a debug view of these, uh, because what we should be seeing is some interpolation of lighting on here. So on a given surface, I should see a color wash, right? Now what I'm seeing instead is a solid color as if each individual uh, one of these panels only had one lighting sample and the whole panel was getting lit by that sample, right? You can see very clearly that that is what I'm, the output I'm getting, and that doesn't match the output I was expecting to get. And even though that doesn't always mean there's a bug, you pretty much any time you get output that's very different from what you'd expected, you need to investigate because you probably have a bug, but even if you don't have a bug, you at least have some assumptions that you've made that are incorrect and you need to educate yourself what those are. So what I'm gonna do is investigate here so that I can figure out if I have a bug or just a misunderstanding of what I myself wrote because you know these things get complicated. Sometimes you think you wrote something that should do something you write it correctly and it doesn't do that thing, it turns out to just be because you misunderstood the what would really happen when this thing occurs, right? So you, you can have those two paths. There's a bug, which is just you failed to write the thing correctly and you need to fix it. 
or there's, hey, this thing doesn't quite work the way you thought, and now you need to readjust your thinking because otherwise you can't make the right modifications to it to get it to do what you actually needed, right? So whichever one it is, doesn't matter. We got to find it. Uh, so let's go in. Oh, and by the way, uh, someone was suggesting that this, uh, on the forums, that this sample hemisphere function isn't uniform. That's correct. Uh, in fact, that's why there's a to-do on here. So uh, we don't know whether we'll care about that eventually. It's not that non-uniform, uh, but it's a bit little bit non-uniform. The reason for that is because it does a cube and then projects the cube onto a sphere. And uh, when you wrap a cube onto a sphere, you, you get bunching uh, along the, the uh, cube boundaries, right? Um, so you will get a cube that's more densely sampled along, like you'll get a hemisphere that's more densely sampled around the lines uh, of the cube. But that doesn't mean you want to replace it. Uh, you have to remember that for approximate lighting, you're, you care about speed a lot. And sometimes doing uniform sampling that's uh, slower can actually be worse than doing more samples that are biased. And you really don't know till you work up with it. Uh, so definitely don't want to jump to conclusions here. So the person who's asked about the forums, don't jump to conclusions about wanting to put in a much slower, which it would be if we made a uniform one, uh, version of this, uh, because we don't know yet whether that's a good decision. The time is not now to, uh, to look at that. All right. Uh, so here's uh, our compute light propagation. Uh, we're not going to modify that right now because we want to investigate it as it is at the moment. Um, and so what we want to do here is we want to have a way that we can flip between uh, our lighting quads and um, our, our normal scene, right? All right. Uh, so here is our output lighting uh, quads function. And what we want to do here is we want to, I think, clean up some of this stuff. Um, we we kind of want to go through and just say, look, I, I'm pretty sure we don't want the voxel thing in here anymore. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, look, we keep backups from every day. If I need to go get old code, I will. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, and get rid of some of this stuff. Right? We just don't we don't need this anymore. Uh, so what I want to do here is I want to kind of just sort of start to clean this up and I want to get a good debug view in here that we can quickly switch between. It was kind of janky before because we never really spent the time to get it right. Uh, I'd like to get it right now uh, and make, make this stuff work the way it should. Uh, so I'm going to just trim out some of this code here, right, um, uh, that we don't need anymore. Uh, I don't need any of this uh, voxel filling stuff. All of this stuff uh, can go away. Uh, so here's what we're kind of looking at here. Uh, and, and we can also clean up some of this, uh, the lighting stuff as well. Uh, we just don't need a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, so we just need to push those lighting textures is like the only thing that we need to push and, and they can have some stuff removed from them too. So again, just cleaning this up and then adding a debug view to it is all I'm really trying to accomplish right now. And that's just to inspect our lighting as we uh, can then debug and refine it. Because I like the way it's looking right now. And I just now I want to I'm I'm at the point where I want to turn the dial and and start improving this scheme rather than continuing to investigate other schemes. I'm pretty happy with where this is going. Um, so we really don't need any of this stuff, right? We're just C and D are the only two uh, things we're using right now. Um, we don't need. Oops! Almost knocked my mug off the the uh, table. And I really don't want to break that mug because I like that mug. Um, it's what I have coffee in. Uh, so what I want to do is just clean that up, get rid of it, uh, and remove all the stuff that was dependent on it, right? Uh, so these things here that were previously dependent on it, I want to get rid of those. I don't want to take those as function calls anymore, right? Uh, I want to uh, remove anything that was dependent on it here. Uh, we don't care about that. <clears throat> Let's see what else we've got. Uh, all right, so that's all good. Uh, in the actual thing that we submit, um, I feel like, are we still submitting that stuff down though? Where's our retina? We, we, there's, uh, we need to remove it from, from one of these things as well, because uh, there's, there's an additional um, uh, 
uh, lighting transfer thing here. So we want to get rid of these and that, and we just want this thing, this uh, render entry lighting transfer is the only thing we actually want. Uh, and that means we can remove some of these textures too here, like uh, we don't need to bind this PNX texture. We don't need to divine um, this lighting lookup either. Uh, and that's good too. One of the nice things about that is it gets us out of the 3D lookup space. Although I'll be honest, we still may need that uh, for the ray tracing side of things. Uh, so we may still have, have to have a sort of like hierarchical structure for that. We don't really know what's going to happen there. Uh, but for the lighting lookup, at least we got out of the 3D texture business. And that's probably a good thing because, you know, the less you can rely on 3D textures, the better things that grow as the cube of a size is always a little bit, um, always a little bit worse than <clears throat> it, something that doesn't, right? Uh, it's, it, you, would, you would prefer to always be 2D if you could be. Uh, we also don't need these light buffers. There's a lot, once, once we are finished with the lighting, we're gonna be able to clean out a lot of cruft, uh, which will be nice. Just things that we just simply don't need anymore. Uh, and that's pretty cool. I always find that to be quite nice. Uh, let's get rid of those. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, P next and lighting lookup. Get rid of those. There we are. And we really don't need to do this anymore, but we'll leave it there because <clears throat> it doesn't hurt. Uh, and so now we have to kind of rebind these a little bit more carefully here. Uh, so technically lighting C will now become uh, two, texture two, I believe, uh, and lighting D will become texture three, right? Uh, like so, we, we will not have any other textures in there. There we go. Uh, and now I need to make sure that those are still lined up properly in the actual Z bias shader. Uh, so those will be in here. Uh, Voxman corner and the cell dim are no longer getting passed down. Uh, the PNX sampler and the lookup sampler are no longer getting uh, passed down in there. Uh, and so those get removed from here, right? Uh, so you got the C sampler and the D sampler, and that's gonna be it. None of those uh, other folks are there. Uh, and I don't know if I've trimmed everything out now. I may have trimmed too much out. Uh, we'll see in a second. Uh, but hopefully we'll, yeah, we'll get some errors here that will tell us um, what stuff is missing. Uh, okay, so let's see what we got here. Program errors should have all the errors, I think. Nope, I got to look in the individual. So let's see, vertex errors, fragment errors, lookup sampler and PNX sampler are still in there. Uh, let's see here, look up sampler. Ah, yeah, so we can clamp, uh, we can get rid of like this stuff, like the clamp vox, some voxel light, that stuff can just uh, get removed, so that's good. Um, and yeah, so all of this stuff that we used to be doing can also get removed, goodbye. Uh, there we go. And again, you can see just even from the look of it, this is just so much cleaner. So if we can make this lighting scheme work, you can just see how much sort of um, effort we're saving just in the basic like uh, execution of the shader will be simpler there, right? Uh, Pnex sampler, is that still in here? Oh. Wait, what? Oh, hmm. All right, maybe I was I was a little overzealous there. So we do still need the light position. So so I guess we need to still have one of these uh, for light positions. Gosh, I really wish we could have these in a more compact format than having to sample from three separate textures. You know, I wish we could just have a buffer you know we probably could right um just have a buffer that has these three things in it um because fundamentally speaking right um we just want to do a buffer fetch you know 
I just don't know that you can do that in the um, in the fragment shader in OpenGL three. Uh, So, you know, what, what I'm trying to say here is just that this stuff is just not really any of it is none of this stuff is what we really want. What we really want is just a lighting texel like this thing, you know, I'm sorry, not like um, uh, textured vertex. I don't know where that guy went. Here it is. What we really want is one of these textured vertex things, right? That's what we actually wanted. Um, and we just want that to be something that we can specify as a buffer, right? I mean, we just want to be able to say, here's the position of the light, here's the you know direction of the light, uh, and here's the color. You know, that's what we want to specify per light per light point coming down, because that's what we fetch in here. You know, and so it would be nice to be able to do one lookup and get all those things back rather than sampling from all these textures, which just creates a lot of overhead. Um, but I just fundamentally don't know if we're allowed to fetch from a buffer and a fragment shader because that sort of thing is a relatively new addition. Uh, and I don't know um, GSL LSL version uh, sample from buffer in fragment shader. Uh, so let's see here. Um, So three quick reference card. Because I don't think you can. So I think, you know, I, I just don't know any other way to do it, I guess is what I'm saying, than still having one. I would like to roll them all into one, but I just don't think you can. Uh, and I'm not sure. So let's take a look. Um, let's see here. Per fragment operations, that's not your cell. Uh, let's see, qualifier, simple, blah, 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 blah. I mean, because in a sense, you could just c c treat it as a uniform, right, as well, and then you just bind a buffer to the uniform. But those usually have very, like, uniforms oftentimes have very hard constraints on how long they can be um, in earlier versions of, of GLSL as well. So I just don't know if that's going to be something we can actually, uh, if we're allowed to use, right? Uh, so let's see here. Yeah, this is one of those questions that's really hard to answer. I wish I could have done a search on it, uh, but it doesn't look like there's any information in the search. Um, shader access to buffer. Yeah, so you can just see, like, we should probably stick with textures, right? Because if you look at it, this is what we want, basically, um, I think, probably. I, again, I just am not sure what the easiest way to do this would be, but I think you'd have to be up to version 4 uh, before you can really count on this uh, being available, right? Uh, let's see here. So yeah, so I'm just I'm just not gonna do it. I'm gonna I'll I'll put it back in the uh, uh, an array for the position. Uh, looking at because this is what we want here. Looking at that, it's like so we've got essentially two sets of four element wide things, um, but I don't think again because they have to be textures. I don't think I can pack those together in any better way, really. You know. Um, so like looking at this, right, 
these two could be packed together if they weren't heterogeneous types. Uh, but I just don't see any real way to do that. Um, and similarly, like I could, uh, I could stick two different color values in. Uh, there are other ways to pack this. So I don't know, like one way to do it would be with two V4 textures, right? Um, like one way to do it would be to say, all right, we've got a V4 like light zero. and a v4 of light data one. So two four wide float textures, right? We could do that. Uh, and these would just be, uh, that would get rid of the concept of max light power, right? The light could be any floating point number that you wanted. And the way this would be packed uh, would be like px, py, pz um, direction x. Uh, and this would be like color R, color G, color B, direction Y. And then you just have two textures. They're both floating point textures. You can now have floating point color values, right? So that you don't have max light power anymore. The power is what, the light is just whatever it is. Uh, and then you have the direction X, direction Y. You recover the Z through normalization because you know the direction has to be a normal. That cuts us down to two texture samples. Seems better to me because we were gonna need floating points for the position or the uh, this e either way. So we're gonna need a wide format either way. Could, we could go to 16-bit, obviously per channel instead of 32-bit, but for now, so I think that's, I think I like that better. So I think I do wanna still cut down all of my textures that way to just two, and then we'll send that down. That gets rid of the max light power as well. So it also kind of buys us something nice there. Uh, and then we just have two 1D textures. And again, those textures are quite small because they're 1D. So let's say even if we doubled this and we went up to um, uh, having uh, 16,000 light source things, which, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to have that much, but let's say that we actually did. Um, again, they're only 1D. So we're talking about eight uh, floats. Each one of those floats is four wide. That's only a half mega texture data. Really not a big deal, right? Um, so again, I feel like minimizing the number of textures there is just better, less samplers. Less fuss. Seems like a good plan. Oh, I forgot we have this new, oops, yeah, we have this new speed crunch thing that someone sent. Uh, that's a better calculator. I should probably leave that up instead. So I like that, and that way we only have two textures still, and that's good. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and try playing with that a little bit uh, and see if we can't make that work out. Uh, and I'm going to call these uh, things that we push on here, I'm just going to call them the same thing. So we've got uh, light data zero uh, and light data one. Uh, okay, light data zero, data one. Actually, I guess we probably want that in both here. Light data zero, light data one. Uh, what is the problem? Cannot convert from F32. Oh, never mind. I actually made those type the same. There we go. Uh, all right, so in the decode power function now, um, I guess that just isn't necessary anymore because if we look at where that was being used, right, decode power uh, was just something that we're using for decoding the packed versions anyway. Um, so in here, this should be fine. So, okay, in, in this, we don't actually have one of these things, so that's fine. going to be this uh, and we, d we are not clamping anymore uh, so what was this doing here output loading textures uh, this is packing these down and we don't really want them packed down we don't want the length this this is not like we don't want any of this anymore actually uh, so the incident light is just the emit C right 
In fact, we don't even need to, yeah, this just does not need to be processed and it's not gonna be packed, right? Um, so what we need to do here is we need to grab the location uh, as well as the um, average direction and we need to pack these together. So really what we're doing here is two packs down flight data zero, flight data one, uh, and what I want that to do, again, is I want that to follow uh, this recommendation uh, that I put here, which is PX, PY, PZ, DX, and CRC, G, CB, right? Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and put those in there. Uh, we know that we've got uh, P.X, P.Y, P.Z. We'll have to fetch that out. Uh, and then we've got our color, so CR, CG, CB, and then we need our P.X, P.Y. So the only thing we don't have here is our position, um, but that's okay because we can easily get the position. Um, the lighting solution has these lighting points in it, and it should just be accessible right off that, if I remember correctly. Um, so where is lighting point? There it is. Uh, so that's all we need right there. It's just that P value. Uh, and I think that's it, right? So that should get everything at and packed into those lighting data structures um, uh, and ready for submission. Uh, this is no longer relevant to anybody. So it should go away. Deleting code is always a good sign, in my opinion. Uh, and then we need to uh, make all of this stuff line up with what we said. So we've got light data zero, light data one, uh, and these two are now both gonna submit floats, four element floats. Light data zero, light data one. Uh, and they're both 1D, this is all correct, so all of that stuff is fine. Um, and uh, yeah, off we go. Uh, so now we have to modify the OpenGL side of things because it's getting those uh, lighting samples coming down. Uh, so we need light data zero and light data one in here to be uh, our new buffer names. Uh, and then in here, we need to allocate those properly. Light data zero, light data one. Light data zero, light data one. And again, we are gonna modify this because now it's gonna be a 32F texture and it's gonna be a GL float, right? So those are just exactly the same as we were doing before, only now we just got two textures of exactly the same kind. If we could, we'd just say this texture had eight elements, right? Uh, but we can't. So we just do two that have four elements uh, each. All right, uh, so, oops, gotta do the bind properly here. Light data one, light data zero. So we've combined both of these, now, oops, or didn't. Uh, and uh, now we need to adjust the shader to account for that properly. So there's light data zero and light data one. And those are in slots two and three. So we should have a slot zero and one and a slot uh, two and three. Don't ask me why I keep typing lie. Um, so now if I go back and look at uh, the light C here, um, let's, let's go grab this stuff. Uh, so now this shader needs to be reworked a little bit. Uh, so you can see in here, when we do the compile ZBIOS program, uh, our samplers, well, that's the vertex shader, so we don't really have to do anything there. But in here, our samplers are C sampler and D sampler. Uh, so this is like light zero sampler, and this is light one sampler. Uh, we need those to be coming through in the right slots. Uh, so we've got them here, light zero sampler, uh, light one sampler. Uh, I don't know what this debug light P thing is, but we're not using it anymore. That was when we used to have a debug light that we moved around. Uh, 
uh, and all this stuff, like the multi-grid up and down, we we just jettisoned all of that stuff. Those were experiments that I didn't like pursue uh, past the initial phase. So that stuff can all go too. It's going to be really nice to like lock this down relatively soon when we're like, ah, now we have our lighting solution and we don't have to worry about any of this stuff anymore. Uh, all right, so those are our two lighting samplers and they're in slots two and three as they were supposed to be uh, where we bound them, right? So they're right there. Uh, and then all we need to do is actually decode those properly, right? So in here where we do our fetching, here we get out the light indices. We then need to fetch uh, light data zero, light data one, uh, and those get fetched uh, off of these samplers. Right? Uh, and so then what we can do is say, well, we can now decode these based on the uh, encoding that we said before. The position value is going to be light data uh, zero RGB. Uh, the light uh, direction here, which is this value, uh, that's going to be light data one's RGB. Oh, sorry. Um, the light color is going to be light data one's RGB, uh, which is in here somewhere. We don't need the max power multiplier anymore. Um, in fact, because it's now a floating point value, so that just becomes a simple multiply. Uh, and then we need to reconstruct the light D. Uh, reconstructing the light D is going to involve a couple steps. The first one is the X, Y value. In fact, I suppose we should say X, Y, Z on here to make it a little clearer that those are positions going through. Um, the X, Y reconstruction is gonna have to start, uh, I guess we could actually write it out this way. Uh, now remember, I only packed two of the value, two of the three values I need. Um, so the uh, x, y, z. So in the alpha channel of each of these, right? I packed the x in here and the y in here. The d value I don't have. I'm sorry, z value I don't have. Uh, so the question is, where am I going to get it? Um, what we're just going to do here is the very simple, uh, you know, exactly what you would expect. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and use exploit the fact. Uh, that these are normals. Oops. Uh, so we're going to do some z-value reconstruction here. Uh, what we know is we had an x, a y, and a z, right? And we only stored these two. So we're looking for this, right? Well, what we know is that since this thing is a normal, right? Since this is a normal that we're talking about here, uh, we know the length of the normal is one. So we know that the length of x, you know, x, the length of x, y, z equals one. What that means is that if we take the Pythagorean theorem and say, well, the length of something, you know, is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, right? And we know that that equals one. Well, we should be able to uh, figure out some way of solving for this z squared, right? Um, so in our case, what we can do is just say, well, it's pretty easy to just square both sides of this thing because this side is one and has no variables on it, right? So that means x squared plus y squared plus z squared has to equal one. Right? Because it doesn't matter whether it's squared or not, the square of one is one. So that basically means that just this without the square root equals one. That makes it pretty trivial for us to go, okay, z squared therefore must equal x minus this quantity, right? Because this was the quantity on the other side. If we subtract it here, we just get this simple arithmetic, right? So the z value must be the square root of x, I'm sorry, of, uh, of the square root of one minus x squared plus y squared. Make sense? Um, so that's just some really simple, you know, uh, uh, algebra, whatever you want to call it, maths. Um, and so what we can do here is say, well, all right, we've, we need to take the square root of one minus uh, light dx times light, do we have a square function? Doesn't matter, I'll just do it manually. Plus light dy times light dy. Right, and now we know that uh, you you look at this, you can sort of say, well, all right, is this is this dicey, right? Because we could get a negative value here, uh, and the answer is like not unless something goes horribly wrong, because we know that uh, each of these values has to be less than one, 
because a normal can't have any component greater than one, uh, right? Because the maximum you can have would just be one, zero, zero, or zero, one, zero, or zero, zero, one, because it can only be one long. So if there's a one in a channel, nothing else could be equal to anything. And there's certainly no where to get longer than one. So something that's one or less than one squared, right? Plus something that's one or uh, less than one squared. Uh, we, we, I guess what I say is we have to assume the property of the normal that its length has to be less than one to mean that no matter what these values are set to be, when we add them together, the same will be true, right? Because remember, if x squared plus y squared plus z squared has to equal one, then x squared plus y squared without adding z squared couldn't be more than one, right? Because the square of a value is always positive, and if we're adding that and still equaling one, then if we take it away, it can only be less, right? So we know this value has to itself be either one or less than one. It can't be more than one. So in theory, this square root, unless we had a really bad numerical precision thing happen where we, I don't know, did a really bad normalize and somehow had values that were greater than one, I don't know. I don't think it's likely. Uh, we could never get anything other than zero here, for example, would be the lowest value we could ever get, right? Uh, which would be one minus one, right? And the square root of zero, of course, is zero, and that's correct, because if we had a one, let's say x was one, we get one times one, and we know y would be zero in that case, because all the value would be the x. We get one times one plus zero times zero, right? So it would be one minus one, and that would be zero that would make z equal to zero, which is exactly what we want. Because if x is one, z has to be zero. There's no more room to have the normal be anything else, right? Um, so that's how we would reconstruct this. And that gives us back all of the variables that we wanted. Uh, we don't care about this at all. Does render setup still have a debug light p in it? Because if so, it does. That should go away because we don't, need a debug light anymore. All right. So uh, now we got to debug it, uh, which hopefully won't be too bad. Special mask element not present in operand. Mm, what? What was wrong with my use of the dot a swizzle? Uh, z bias. Oops. Z bias. Uh, say again, Mr. Shader Compiler. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Those are from the V4 is not the V3s. My bad. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, we have now, like, just by re-encoding those, we must have had a bug in how we were encoding them before. Uh, because now that we're encoding them directly, we do get color washes now, uh, which is not what I was expecting. So we must have accidentally fixed a bug, um, unless we introduced a bug that's generating color washes, but the color washes actually look somewhat correct here uh, for the sample points that we gave, which are not particularly good sample points, right? Uh, so that's a little bit weird, uh, but we must have fixed a bug. Our way that we were encoding light powers must have been wrong, I'm guessing. Um, that's interesting. Okay, well, it's fine. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, now that we've got that encoded, what I want to do is what I set out to do originally, um, but I'm kind of glad we did that because that puts us in a much better position now than we were before. Um, what I'd like to do now uh, is I'd like to go ahead and draw those sample points, have a way of drawing out the sample points. <clears throat> Uh, so what we want to do here again is we want to have ways in which we can uh, uh, intentionally not draw uh, lighting for these particular samples. Um, 
and just output solid color values that get interpreted directly. And remember, we did the work last weekend to make it so that we could draw things that did not have lighting. Again, that's why now, remember before it was actually lighting our text? Remember that? Um, well, now we've got a way to not do that, right? Which is this, uh, and that's really good. Uh, so I'm happy about that, and we can now um, leverage that fact again when we do our debug drawing because that allows us uh, to avoid the problem of having what, we're, what is trying to be a debug display get then affected by the lighting computation, which is literally what we're trying to debug, so we really don't want that to be true, right? Okay. Uh, so now let's start to clean this code up. So we've got two pieces of the code that are interacting to create this uh, situation here. Uh, so we've got our F key pressed stuff here. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Sorry, I'm a little stuffy today, as I almost always am. I'm an, an allergy sort of person. It's not great, it's not pleasant. Uh, so anyway, what I want to do here is is go ahead and, and figure out how exactly this stuff is going to work. We're running the lighting every time now. Uh, so I think what we want to do is uh, just sort of change uh, uh, some of these uh, way these keys are working. Oh, I didn't realize that the iteration count there could be beefed up. Uh, I wonder what happens if I adjust that. Whoa, that's weird. So we have some weird bugs there. Oh no, that just reduces it to zero. You can see that we have like a power leakage problem, which I think I know why that is because we're not being particularly careful with that. But uh, as we increase the iteration count, everything gets brighter, right? Which is not, we don't really want that. We want a solution that doesn't do stuff like that. So this will be good as we debug this, we'll get much better lighting results. Um, so there's just a first bounce, right? You can see you don't get any secondary lighting. Here's a second bounce and you can see, you can see the blue lighting come in here, right? Can you guys see that? So no indirect lighting, all the light is coming from a white light source. Now we get indirect lighting, we get that blue. Uh, and you can even see it here, like, so what happens is this, and this is what's so cool about lighting, right? And that's why I'm really glad we're doing this, because I don't, I don't know. I know there's some folks who just want to do game programming stuff, and they don't like this technical stuff. But unfortunately, that's not what this series is about, right? This series is about technical minutiae. That's why I do it, right? Uh, I'm not a game designer, so I don't care about game code in the slightest. Um, but I love that, right? So we're going to have, as we get this working really well, you can kind of see the kind of lighting subtleties that this adds to the scene that are just really kind of nice. So that first bounce gives you the, the blue light here. It also lights these surfaces. That surface would get no light. So if we just did direct lighting, this surface gets no light. Now that we do it, this, it's starting to get light from the bounce off of these, right? And off of the, this. And then now it's redistributing its light to its nearby tiles. And now you get a red bounce light. That's a bounce off of a surface that couldn't even have been seen itself on the first one. So you just add these really nice lighting cues, right? And you can kind of see as we get this going uh, better, it's, it's just really kind of cool, I think, what this, the character this will add to the game. So if you imagine us just kind of getting this nicely tuned, getting rid of the flicker uh, and, and having those kind of nice lighting effects in the game as subtle lights as you move through the environment, as uh, projectiles move through the environment, whatever. Uh, I just think that adds so much character to a scene and just makes it feel so uh, interesting and reactive. And, and, you know, I mean, that's why you're playing a game in the first place, right? A lot of people don't appreciate the degree to which audiovisuals impact your gameplay experience, but they do. You could just go play a board game if you didn't want audiovisual feedback, immediate, fast audiovisual feedback. The whole point of playing a video game is that you have this immediate audiovisual feedback and that it's rich and interesting play a card game or a board game if you don't want that, right? It, it, it's fundamentally not a video game experience if you don't have this kind of uh, rich AV because that's what defines a video game as compared to um, a, uh, a non-video game, right? So it, it is sometimes overlooked. Uh, everything works together in a video game. There isn't one important part. Um, the gameplay is just as important as everything else, but it is not 
the it's not uniquely important. Everything works together uh, to create the game experience. And if any one of those things is lousy, the game is worse than it should be, right? Um, everything should work together to form the game experience. Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and finish this up. So our submission looks like it's working nicely here. Uh, this is some stuff that we can optimize more. For example, uh, we will probably just have this generated on the GPU in the future, so that's what we'll you know, be looking towards, certainly. Uh, this output lighting call now, we kind of need to make this stuff uh, make a little bit more sense here. Uh, so output lighting and output lighting textures and all this stuff, uh, we need to kind of clean up the way this is working. Uh, so output lighting textures... Uh, so you can see right here how this is going. This is happening every frame. Oops. Uh, whether you push F1 or not. Uh, and so this is doing the recomputation of that. Uh, and it's doing that output every every frame. We could do it only once in a while with the F1 key if we wanted to. In fact, I guess I'll leave, you know, I'll I'll leave that in there. in case we do want to do that. But so this is happening every frame. And so the part that we want to determine uh, a little bit earlier here, right, is what actually is getting uh, output every time. And we don't really need to do it the way we were doing it here. That, that doesn't need to be an if else kind of a thing, uh, right? We can continue doing the uh, simulation potentially because it doesn't really matter if that's going on behind uh, the scenes, I suppose. I'm not sure. Maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. Um, uh, but either way, if we decide to do a, uh, if we decide to switch to show lighting here, uh, then really all that has to happen is that keyboard has to be here to toggle, right? So if you hit the F1 key, we have to switch between outputting the lighting directly uh, and um, doing the push lighting here, right? Uh, so what we want to do is we want probably, uh, an out we probably want this to be a little bit more sensible. Let's go ahead and grab this here. Uh, so we want this output lighting to be like output lighting sampler or, or uh, output lighting points probably. Uh, and then in the future, we'll probably want output lighting occluders to also be in there. Uh, so we can debug inspect either of them. Right. Uh, so let's go ahead and actually let me just make sure that works without this first. Uh, and so now what we should be able to do, right, is we should be able to toggle between those two modes at any time. So we're, you know, we're looking at the, the lighting solution here. We hit F1, we look at the debug, we hit F1 and we're back. I don't know why it flashes once there, probably because uh, nothing's been downloaded yet to that. I'm not sure. We'll have to look and see if that makes sense or not. Um, but <clears throat> that sets us up uh, to actually put in something that displays those lighting points there. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is just going to loop over those lighting points. So, you know, exactly the way we were doing it here where we output them, right? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do something very similar, but instead we're going to uh, just you know, do output draws on them, right? Um, okay. Uh, so the first thing we want to do here is turn off the, uh, the secondary lighting of that. And I think that happens automatically, right? So you can see if, if show lighting, if, if we're not in show lighting mode, uh, then lighting gets enabled. But if we are in show lighting mode, then we, we won't be, right? Uh, and so I think we could even move that down because nothing gets drawn up here, uh, I don't think. Uh, I'm pretty sure so that, that could, if it wanted to kind of stay up here, uh, could be moved down, we could do that. Um, so it'll enable lighting uh, in this case, uh, but it won't enable lighting in the other case, right? Uh, so I think that's all good. And then all we have to do in here is we have to actually um, we have to actually output this for real. 
So we know that we want to output a point count number of quads, right? That's what we want to output. Uh, and then we want to effectively do what we were doing here, but we want to do it uh, based on the data we have now, not the data that we uh, used to be outputting, right? Uh, so we need to figure out how to, we're going to do that. Um, we can delete this code here, uh, and we can also make the bitmap uh, call be up there. Let's go ahead and clean that out. Okay. So we just need to make sure that this stuff all makes some sense. Uh, we've got this UV stuff uh, that, that again, is going to be ignored because there's no texture on these, so we're just setting it to nothing. So all we have to worry about is drawing the p-values and the c-values. Those are the two things that we need to output. Uh, and we need to figure out good ways to output those. Okay. So the p-value is pretty easy. We already know what that is. Uh, the c-value is, is perhaps a little bit harder, right? Um, now, uh, like you can see what happens here. We could just take exactly what we were taking before where we have this p-value. Uh, we don't have element widths or heights anymore because remember these are lighting sample points. They know, they're they not occluders, so they're just a locus. So this width and height, um, we can just call these element width and element height basically. Um, and the x and y axis are gonna have to be generated in, in, a, in a different way as well. So this is, this is a little bit of work here. It's, it's not much, it won't be hard. Uh, but it's it's just a little bit of work. So what we want to do is pick an element width, uh, and we want that element width to probably be pretty tiny, right? Uh, we we just want little tiny like little tiny squares that just are at the sample points, so we can see them all. We don't want these like big surface anymore because they're not these are not the occluders. These are not things that are getting that are uh, going to intercept rays that are doing samples. These are sample points. They are individual like. Um, light collecting locations that we've scattered out and that we will use to interpolate. So we just want to see little uh, markers so we can look at the lighting of the scene as we go through, right? Um, so what I want to do is, is just keep those pretty tiny. We'll tune those as we see it. Maybe we want it to be a little bigger than that. Maybe we don't, I don't know. Uh, don't ask me why that negative 0.3 was in there. I don't know, it's probably historical reasons uh, that have long been forgotten. Uh, so what we want to do here is, is uh, generate an x and y axis, and the question is, uh, how do we want to generate that x and y axis? Well, we can just use, I think, the original normals that we had in here. Uh, I seem to recall us storing that information, um, and yeah, there they are. They're duplicated out from the lighting surface. Uh, so what I can do here is I can say that we have a normal, uh, and then what we can do is we can generate an x and y axis uh, from that normal. The other thing we could do is look up the surface index. In fact, that may be smarter because that actually has the x and y axis in it uh, so that they'll be aligned to the surface that they were on. That sounds like a better idea to me. So, hey, if it sounds like a better idea to me, let's do it. Um, so solution uh, surfaces, uh, I guess we gotta, we probably wanna grab these actually out as elements here. So let's, let's do that. So we can access multiple things off them. Oops. Ah! Okay, there we go. Uh, so there we go. Grab the point out. Uh, and then we need to grab the surface. Lighting surface, surface, plus solution surfaces, uh, plus surface index. Like so. Um, so for now, we'll just grab that out. In the future, maybe we won't have access to this, in which case we'll have to change uh, and generate them from the normal, which we can do, it's not hard, um, but there we go. So we get the x-axis, the y-axis out of the surface. Um, we don't need the normal. Uh, we do have the emission color and average direction of light here. We don't actually, we're not gonna be actually using that average direction of light um, for anything here, because we don't have a way to really output that at the moment. Uh, it would be nice if we did. Uh, so I'm gonna put it to do here, Casey, uh, draw a quad that extends in this direction. Maybe, uh, we've got a line segment call, we should probably use it. Uh, so that, you know, let's look at that in a second. Let's get this working first. Uh, so we've got the, the color value here. Uh, this stuff we're not touching. Uh, so we've got the, the uh, front emitter that's like a clamp version of these. So we, we need to do that again. 
Uh, and we don't have a way of rendering any really bright stuff. So we're just going to have to do the standard clamp here. We could scale the, the values down if we want to, uh, but you know we'll have to see what happens there. Um, so then we got to do uh, these encodes here, the C0, C1, C2, C3 stuff. Uh, that stuff um, looks like it can all stay the same uh, to me. We don't have a transparency value anymore. Um, so I think this can literally just be this, right? Uh, that all looks pretty good. Uh, so the emit C here, I'll just grab that the way we were grabbing it. There's the emit C, uh, we do it in the clamps and put it into the V4, uh, then we pack it down and send it into the standard quad pipeline. Nothing out of the ordinary there. Um, and so I think I think that is most of it. Uh, yeah, I really don't see anything else we need to do there. Um, so that should generate uh, sort of a, a sea of points for us. Of course, we may have made some mistakes in there, uh, but here's what we're you know normally rendering. Uh, here's our, our sea of points, right? You can see where our lighting samples are. Uh, and I feel like they're maybe a little too small, so I, I went a little bit overboard there. Uh, let's go ahead and beef them up uh, a little, see if that helps. Uh, that's pretty good, right? Uh, so here you can see all of our lighting sample points. Um, and uh, we turn off the simulation when we're in this mode. I don't love that, so I think maybe what we'll do is not do that. Um, and we'll let this fall through. So uh, the problem here, uh, well, hmm. So the problem here is this wants to render in line. Uh, I don't know if we can make a trash render group for this stuff. Uh, let's see here. How does that work? Uh, So yeah, I mean, normally, normally we do have the ability to do a non-sim step, right? Because um, this is it. So, you know, we should be able to do this begin sim either way, because no rendering has happened yet. So this stuff, really could be you know where that happens essentially so what we could do here is say look this is not what we actually want to do right we're going to leave this stuff uh out doing its doing its thing right um and what i'm going to do is going to put this inside of here uh, so once we actually do, um, do the, do this part of it, we'll switch between which kind of sim we're doing, right? Uh, so if we take a look here at who needs the render group, it's really just here and here, and the particles are disabled at the moment. Um, so we should be able to do something where we do like that. Uh, I think, can the render group be passed as a zero here probably? I'm guessing it can be. Because otherwise, how would we do it, right? Yeah, these are all optional, right? Uh, so we can pass a zero render group there, uh, which is all we would really have to do. Um, so, you know, what I could do actually, I can do this really straightforward, I, I think. Um, I think we can just do uh, something like this. Oops. So didn't want to do that. I hit the P key instead of the, I hit the wrong key. Uh, 
Um, so what I can do here is just say, all right, uh, I think that gives me what I want. So what I can do is make a temporary variable here called use render group, which I can set to zero if I want to, right? Uh, so basically what I'll do is if we are uh, going to output the lighting points, then I'll just set use render group to zero. So all this stuff, uh, when it goes through, will not actually affect, it won't actually affect the render group at all, right? Um, I think that'll work. Except that, that should be the regular render group. Well, that didn't do what I had hoped. Uh, and I guess I can see why. So the problem is the lighting will get updated. Ugh. Yeah, I see what the problem is. So what I really have to do is erase what's been pushed so far, which, which really isn't gonna work. So I guess we really can't avoid having it just be stationary, um, which is unfortunate. We would have to do things further down the pipeline because by the time it gets to the lighting test here, when it recomputes the lighting test, it will have only had the point geometry, which is not what it needs. Uh. Yeah, so there's no real way to cleanly do that at the moment, unfortunately. So that's pretty much the way it's gonna have to stay at the moment, which is too bad. Not the end of the world, but it's not what I would have preferred. All right. Um, so here we can see all those samples. I'm still going to say maybe even just a little bit bigger on those samples. Uh, so here we can see all of the lighting sample points that we sent down. Uh, and we can kind of see uh, where that light is getting spread through, right? Uh, and so if I go through and I um, take a look at the bounces, so here's the first one, here's the second one, you can see everywhere it ended up spreading out to. And I'll be honest, that doesn't look super correct to me. Um, you know, I, I, it's possible that none of the random rays that were sent out from, say, this surface up here, it's possible that none of them hit these closer to these. They only hit closer to the bottom. It just doesn't seem likely, you know? Uh, and maybe we have to draw the rays themselves to really know, but it just doesn't seem likely. So that seems a bit odd, um, just so we're on the same page there. All right, so one bounce, two bounces now. And even now it's still not, still hasn't hit, nothing has hit those. Um, so it, it honestly, it looks kind of like it only ever adds to, I think maybe our, our pick, the way we're picking which point to add to when we hit the surface may be buggy. Uh, that's what I'm thinking just in my head right now. 
I, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, I, I think that's almost certainly the case. So I want to go look at that right now because even before we get any further into this uh, uh, lighting, debugging, and refinement, I feel like this part of our code is busted uh, at the moment. Uh, so I'm not sure why, but it definitely looks that way. It looks like this picking process is not working um, for whatever reason. So you can see what's going on here. Uh, we do a, uh, a test to see if the raycast that we did hit a surface. When we find the surface that it hit, um, we loop so the surface point index thing here. Uh, we loop over however many lights that surface supposedly had on it. We grab the point index of each of those, right? Um, by starting at the light index that that surface starts at and adding, you know, zero, one, two, three, up to however many it's supposed to have. Uh, and we have initialized the closest distance squared to F32 max. So it's, you know, it will always be higher than anything you could throw at it, anything other value. Um, oh, I see exactly the problem here. Don't, no, no, I don't. No, I take it back. No, no. Uh, so then we, we do this light index plus source point index. We're done with that. We do lighting point, uh, star hit point equals solution points plus point index. So that should dereference that particular point, right? Uh, we then take the distance between the rays location, uh, which, you know, maybe we should verify we actually are getting that. That could be wrong. Maybe that's computed improperly. Uh, would be one ex one way this could be failing. Uh, the raise position minus the, the hit point uh, position. And we see which one of those is least. Uh, we then record the point index that that was as the closest point index. And we record the closest distance squared as its distance. Now, that looks pretty straightforward to me. Assuming accumulate sample works properly, does it? It looks like it. Uh, so I guess what I would say is, um, also we replicated surface N, didn't we? So we don't actually need surface in here. Because that could just come from the point now. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so what I'm wondering is, it, yeah, did we somehow, is this not the real, you know what, I think, I think this would, is the, so this is the relative origin. I think we don't want that. Right, uh, so we never actually did compute that value. Uh, so I think that's what's happening. I think this is ray origin plus T ray times ray D, I think is what we actually need here. Uh, and to be fair, since relative origin is just the ray origin minus the source P, what we could do too is just re reconstruct it, right? It'd be ray P. Um, and we just need to add the source P back in, right? So this, this value is missing from that computation, right? Because it's been subtracted out here. Um, so it just needs to get added back in. Uh, so that's the same value with, with one less multiply. So that seems good, right? Um, but now let's take a look at what we've got here. And already it looks much more correct, right? Um, so here's that first one and hey, lo and behold, my intuition was correct. Um, these sample points uh, are now getting lit, which they weren't before. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, and then if I add uh, in one more iteration here, so there's one iteration, right? Add a second iteration in. Uh, now the bounces are lighting up all the points, which is exactly what we would want. So that looks much better to me, right? 
uh, that looks much more sane. Uh, and so I think we need to work on the algorithm now, but at least now that that was definitely a bug and exactly as I suspected, having some debug code in there made it really easy to find. I don't think we would have found that without that code, right? Uh, so there's one bounce. There's two bounces. Uh, there's three and so on. Um, so again, one of the nice things too about the having this scheme that has uh, lighting samples that are uh, basically controllable separately per surface is that it does mean we can also over tessellate, like we can put more samples on surfaces that we care more about uh, and less samples on surfaces that we care less about. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is I feel like we're not probably having enough samples taken, especially because how fast this is running um, which we don't really want it to run this fast. Um, I think we do want to do a thing where we uh, up this ray count, right? So I don't know what the best ray count value is, but we want these to be higher certainly um, than, the, than they were before. Uh, so here is a, a slower version um, that's running. Uh, I'm not sure how many bounces this is. So here's one bounce uh, running with, with sort of more samples. Uh, and here's two bounces running with more samples, right? Uh, and I'm just looking at what ends up happening with the lighting on these. I'm interested to know why the lighting is so different between some of these. Um, and I guess that's just because of, of the randomness of how the light uh, happens to go. Um, so yeah, I think the most sensible thing to do now is just to, take a look at, um, at the lighting algorithm itself and start to improve the quality of how we're distributing light, uh, in general, right? What we'd like to do is try to figure out some ways to make it more energy neutral. Um, like our, ideally what we would like is some way of saying, well, if you run this thing for four iterations or you run it for eight iterations, you'll still get roughly the same brightness of light. You'll just get it distributed more correctly than it was before, you know? Um, that's what we would like. We'd like a way of saying um, that that we're, the total amount of light in the scene isn't going to just keep going up and up the more iterations you run. Ooh, anyway, we'd like to be sort of unbiased in, in uh, sort of the more sa sampling meaning of the term where we converge towards a correct solution from no particular side. Like it just kind of like generally averages out to the correct solution. So we oscillate around it rather than something that's always going to keep going higher or lower or coming up from one side always right we'd like something that produces correct results on average rather than uh something that kind of just randomly bouncing light around and hey we sort of tweaked it till it looked okay right so i think we'd like to improve that solution as as we can uh and what i would like to do is i'd like to make it possible to run the bounces uh so in this mode, you know, I can continuously hit the keys to like change uh, how many iterations we're doing there. Uh, and what I think I would like to do is I think I'd like to make it uh, so that we can uh, do that same key presses in here. And so what, what that would require is when I hit that key press, run it once with the correct geometry uh, and then go, uh, right? So basically, um, when you hit one of these, 
uh, there's like a recompute lighting equals false. Uh, recompute lighting equals true. Like so. Uh, and so then when we come through here, we would say like, okay, um, if we're not recomputing the lighting and we're showing the lighting, then do this thing, right? Otherwise do the other path. Uh, and that way we can just sort of make it really easy to quickly uh, do that in the other mode without having to do the little toggle dance. Um, right? So one bounce, two bounce, three bounce, four bounce, right? And it just like, it does that quick flash re-render um, so that it's pretty easy to do that cycling. Uh, so that's that's all I really wanted it to do. Uh, and those sample points are still too small. No, I, you know, I, I was saying we did wand them small and it came back to bite me because it turns out we really want them pretty big. Um, so I keep up in the size here uh, till we get something that's that's nice and big. It's pretty good. Um, so now we can sort of see this a little bit better detail as I kind of go out. So there's the first bounce, second bounce, third bounce, fourth bounce, fifth bounce, right? Like so. Uh, and let's take a look at how that bounce works out. Uh, when we're over like here, let's say. Uh, so there's uh, no bounces, first bounce, second bounce, third bounce, right? Uh, and you can kind of see again that these are bounces off of this colored light source, right? That's the blue light. So it's getting pure light on it, but when it reflects light out, because remember, these are not showing what the surface will show. These are showing what light hit there. So it was white light that hit here, uh, but it was blue light that hit here, right? Um, and as that goes, you can see that it continues to add more light, bounce light off of these surfaces as well. Uh, you can kind of see that happening, right? Uh, we need to get rid of that little snake dude. He keeps jumping around, making it uneven for us to look at what the lighting solution is. Now there should be no snake dude. Um, so yeah. Uh, so there you can see a lighting solution in place. Um, and if we look at the bounce sequence here, uh, first bounce, second bounce, third bounce, fourth bounce, right? Fifth bounce. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at. So what we want to do here is I think we want to start to try and get that lighting bouncing to work um, better. And I think we want a couple things to do here. So first of all, uh, we need to, to think about this from a We're, we're kind of a weird like hybrid concept, right? We are sort of a ray tracer, sort of, we're sort of a like render first lighting model, right? But we're sort of half a radiosity solution as well. Uh, so we're kind of doing a radiosity solve because at the end of the day, we're producing lighting samples that are then used later so instead of actually producing the light that is going to be shot towards the viewer's eye and counted like we would be doing in a ray tracer, we're really using the ray tracing to produce a radiosity solution, which is just remembering what light was incident on a surface or an irradiance cache. Um, remembering what light was incident on a surface so that somebody later can come uh, and use that information to properly light uh, the scene, right? Uh, so we're kind of in the middle of those two, and we need to just be aware of that. Um, what we want to do here is we want to uh, start to think about how we're going to do that conservation of energy there 
uh, so that we don't just keep getting brighter and, and that sort of stuff. And, and, and also, we want to keep in mind how we get a skylight in there. All right, so let's talk about this real quick. How much time do we have? We have about 15 minutes, I think. Yes. Um, let's see here. Day 417. Oh, wait, I already did that. Uh, so this right here is just... So I'm going to put that in big old quotes. Uh, the reason I'm going to put that in quotes is because we're not really going to be doing anything hardcore here, probably. But we are going to start to try and think about this concept uh, sort of in a loose sense because we actually care uh, in this case. Uh, we're not just doing it for vague technical uh, fun. We actually do need this to be true to make our lighting solution reasonable. And what we mean by this is... So the way our current scheme is working is, let's say we have a light source here that's shining down on the scene. We've got a reflector and another reflector, right? Okay, so what we do on our iterations is we shoot light and we add the light to this thing, uh, which now can collect some light, and it then becomes a light itself, uh, which can then shoot light as well, and this then becomes a light itself, which can shoot light. At no time do we diminish that amount of light. So basically, the more iterations we run, iteration one, right, added some light to the system. Iteration two added more light to the system. So it's not moving light around so much as it's actually adding light uh, to the scene, literally adding it. So the amount of light you have in iteration one is less than the amount of light you have in iteration two, is less than the amount of light you have in iteration three, and so on and so on. So what I want to do here is I want to have a way where we can conserve the amount of energy that's in the scene. So when you put a certain amount of light energy in, you get a certain amount of light energy out, no matter how many iterations you happen to run. Now the light may spread out differently depending on how many iterations you run, and in fact it better, otherwise those iterations aren't doing anything. Uh, but we need some way of making the total light energy uh, to, to make sure that the total amount of light energy is not increasing, right? So one way we could do this is split in half the amount that we send out versus the amount that we keep on any given light iteration, for example, right? So let's say, for example, we take a particular light source and we say, okay, that light source is going to emit 50% uh, of its light and it's going to keep 50% of its light, right? In that case, we know that no matter what happens, we will never add more light to the scene than we had originally. This would be a very simple way for us to conserve the energy that we have. Uh, so I'm going to try something like that first, see if we can even out the amount of energy so that we'll stay uniform throughout the process. So let's see how we would do that. Here we are. <coughs> Just let me take a drink because my throat... It's drying out. Alright. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to do here is just going to go into the uh, light propagation system. And I'm going to take a look at how we're actually doing this uh, distribution. Okay. So, what you can see is we're looking for surfaces to send light from. And anything that's got some emission to send, we're going to use. <clears throat> uh, so what we do here is we say, OK, we're going to uh, take a sample direction. We're going to ray cast out. And if we hit something, uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to accumulate some light into that thing. right? And the amount that we're going to uh, send is this emit C right here and this power. right? How is that power getting interpolated right here? So it's basically just, yeah, it's just uh, whatever the light color we sent down was, the power is, is implicit in that. So we could actually, uh, like, we could if we wanted to, we could have rolled these into one, but it doesn't matter. 
so we have the emit C, right? And we know uh, how much power we're going to use here. Uh, the amount of power that we're going to use here is one over the ray count. So if every ray hit, that's how much power we would we would dissipate the total amount of light uh, from the light source, right? But we don't necessarily want to do that anymore. Uh, what I'd rather do is say, okay, what we're going to do instead uh, is we're going to emit only 50% of the light source's power, let's say, and we'll keep 50%. Now you can see how that would play out down here. Like right, right now we're doing a source emit C point index plus destiny. So they're just purely summing up how much light I got this frame versus how much I had, you know, and so on. Uh, what I'd rather do here is say, okay, what we want to do is modify the source emit C probably uh, by how much ever much light it sent out uh, and the dest emit C um, will get added to it afterwards, right? So what we could do is say, okay, when we update this value, what we're going to do is say, um, we've got an amount that's, that's coming in. So it's like uh, light absorption right, um, or, or light retention. So what we want to do is say there's a certain amount of light retention. Maybe it's half, like I said, maybe it's not, uh, but we'll see. So then in here, what we're going to say is we're only going to dissipate one minus the, total, the, the light retention factor that we're going to keep in this light itself. We will only send out that much light. And some light gets lost, right? Uh, because if a ray doesn't hit, that light would get lost. What that means is we may have to adjust um, to only get rid of light that actually didn't get that, that, that actually got sent somewhere, right? Because now you can see we have the opposite problem, which is the light gets dimmer and dimmer as we go. And the reason for that, of course, is that it's sending light out of the scene, right? Um, so that's actually good. It means we're doing the right thing here. It's just we need a, a way of making sure that we keep distributing the light we have if we can't have, you know, uh, how should I say this? We, we, yeah, we need that light to basically be uh, retained if it doesn't have a hit. Now, the problem with doing that um, is we don't have a way of saying, oh, we need to uh, we need to keep more of it because we're not writing to source emit up here. But that's okay because remember, the dest emit C is getting accumulated for this point. So what we can do is we could say, all right, let's remember how much power we have left, right? Uh, and let's just add that in. Uh, so what we could do is we could even get rid of this plus equals entirely, right? Uh, we could say, get rid of that. It's just equals the dest. And what we could say is let's try to remember how much power we didn't distribute, okay? Um, so what we could say is, all right, we've got a light retention value. Uh, we know that our retained power is going to be the light retention amount by default. And then every time we miss a ray, we will add that power back in. So when we come through here and we say like, okay, um, uh, this actually needs to be in here. Um, so we're deciding that we're gonna take one of these uh, guys, we're gonna update their emission, right? Uh, so we have two options, two paths we can go down. Uh, one, and you actually, you know what I could do here? I could do this a little bit saucier. Right, I could say also the retained power, I could also make this be something that gets subtracted from every time we hit. Uh, so we could see the retained power is the full power of the light source, right? It keeps all of it by default. Um, and so then when we're done here, what we would do is say, okay, the destination, uh, the destimate C, right? So the destimate C of this emitter is going to be equal to its emit C times its retained power. So by default, it will retain everything and just keep a 1.0. So then what we'll do is we'll say every time we hit, right? Every time we do an accumulate sample, 
We know we're passing down this power value, so let's just subtract that out of its retained power. Right? Like so. So now every time a ray hits, we retract that amount of power out. So by ma the maximum amount we can possibly send out is the light retention amount. But if we don't send out that much, we'll still retain that light on our surface, right? So we'll either send the light somewhere or we won't. Um, but it shouldn't get dimmer now, hopefully. Although it does seem to get a, li a little dimmer. We'll have to find out what's going on there. Um, it could just be that the, the light ends up collecting in particular places. But now nah, there's something something going on there. You can see we lose a little bit. So we're off by something in the equation somewhere. There's a little bit of cruft in there, right? Um, but we're getting there, right? Uh, so now we can kind of see that we've got some, uh, some more conservation of energy, definitely, but it's not quite right yet. It still gets dimmer than, than we would like, right? Uh, we also don't know that we want our retention factor to be this high. Like we might want to retain less of the light, right? It may be that we want to send out 75%. Uh, but of course, I think, like I said, we've still got bugs in here. So it's hard to gauge correctly at this point, right? Yeah, you can kind of see that light getting lost in there, right? All right, so let's f figure out how we're getting leakage here. Like what's happening there? Okay, um, so we're stepping through here and we're saying that the amount of power that we're going to send out is going to be one minus the light retention uh, divided by the ray count, right? Whatever that, that ray count is, because that's how many we're sending out here, right? Per, uh, per iteration or whatever, right? Um, I guess one thing I don't know is as the ray count drops down, what's the minimum the ray count? It may be that the ray count, how does the ray count get modified? Uh, if ray count is less, is greater than eight, let's say. Because it keeps dropping down with each one and, and that may be part of it too. All right, so there we go. Now we know we're always sending out some rays, right? All right, so we're losing energy. Why are we losing energy? Uh, it could just be floating point nonsense, but you know, it's probably something real. Uh, so I guess one problem is the power that we add always gets attenuated by the angular, angular fall off. So that is probably where we're losing our power, right? So in accumulate sample, for example, uh, and I actually, the problem with accumulate sample is that never really worked out to be a very good out of line function because it kind of always needs to be in line, uh, which is not great for us. But you can see here that the actual power that we add um, is uh, affected by the angular fall off. Uh, so what we might want to do is say, well, okay, the angular fall off there is going to have to be taken into account. Uh, so maybe we say something more like this. And we say we don't dissipate that power. Uh, we only dissipate power we actually used, right? Um, and it's better, but it's still not right. We're still losing too much power there, right? I don't think that's an accidental function. I think that that looks to me like we're uh, we're still having issues, right? Um, but that's definitely one source of it. So here, we, this is we now know um, exactly how much uh, light we're actually adding here, uh, and so we should end up with keeping as much retained power as we uh, as was actually kept, right? Uh, we've given away this much. We keep this much retained. Um, so, yeah, what else happens here? Anything else? So I don't see...
So I don't really see uh, a problem here immediately. So I'm not sure where I'm losing the rest of my power here. Um, so I'm coming through this each iteration and I've got my power retention here. Uh, I'm basically saying that the power that I'm going to distribute per ray is however much light retention I want uh, divided by the ray count, right? Uh, and then I'm saying I'm going to retain 1.0 of my power by default. So if we never actually emitted everything, the power should remain the same because it would always just be emit C times retained power and power retained power is one. So emit C, death emit C is just gonna be the source emit C. Um, oh, there it is, reflection color. That is the problem right there. Uh, so we don't wanna do this Hadamard product, right? Uh, we want to do this. Okay. Um, oh, so close. We get out many iterations before losing uh, power now, but it still looks like that. that's probably not just numerical precision. That still looks like uh, we've got something janky happening in there uh, to me. I could be wrong, but that looks like that to me. Um, I mean, it does take a really long time before you uh, use it up, but I'm gonna keep hunting anyway, just to make sure. Um, so yeah, so this way we're taking the original source and we're just saying the retained power times that should, should be enough to keep us from losing light um, because we're adding that power to other light sources as we go. Um, it, c it could be that we're just at the point where it's, you know, it's numerical precision makes it so that there's not much we can do uh, to get it something that doesn't lose a little bit, right? Um, uh, and so that light absorption, so now, you know what? So here's the other thing. So since we are bouncing, the light we're bouncing is gonna be modified by the reflection color, we're actually bouncing less light than we originally had. Um, so we kind of need to retain that light in us would be the way we'd have to do it. That's kind of a tricky thing. Do you see what I'm saying? So we're gonna send out light that's been pre mod. It's been multiplied by our reflection color, right? That's the light color we're gonna send out. And so that means that by default we've absorbed some of that light. And every time we send it out, we're gonna absorb it because we're counting that power against us. So we're eliminating some of that power from us. Uh, that we can't send out again. So what's the best way to handle that? I mean, one way to look at it is to do it more accurately where we're just actually absorbing that color of light. And so what we're sending out is the other colors. How would this work exactly? The other way is to just normalize the amount of power and say, well, whatever the power actually is that we're sending out is that much less than what we had.
So I can't say I really know the right way to capture that piece of information. Hopefully everyone understands what I'm talking about. Um, namely that the Hadamard product here is taking whatever the source emit color is that we have, which is our light that we received. We're modifying it by our reflection color, which degrades its energy, right? Uh, and so I'm just not entirely certain how to record that degradation. Should I just try to measure that degradation and when I subtract the power from it, modify it? So for example, um, like make a retention coefficient here, uh, the retention coefficient is going to be equal to something like the length of the emission uh, reflection amount. And so, you know, whatever that length is, uh, whatever the sort of amount of power that is going to be lost by this, uh, we modify the retained power by that, right? So when we, when we subtract away that light power, we've got baked into it the concept that it's the light itself is not uniform. Um, I don't know. That, that as written is definitely not going to work. Uh, but I'm just wondering if something similar to that can work. Uh, because this would have values that are over one and stuff. So I don't, that's just going to be a nightmare, I think, probably, but I'm not sure. Um, Yeah, that still gets down to zero eventually. Looks like it anyway, right? Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so I definitely need a different way of counting photons, right? And I may need to count them uh, on the red, green, and blue channels separately. The problem is I don't want the color to shift because uh, surfaces are supposed to be the color that they are. But I guess in some sense that's okay because the it's that's actually correct. I mean, what a red surface does is it absorbs green and blue photons. So the green and blue photons that hit it aren't going to bounce back out again, right? But they are going to stay there. So I think I just need a, my my retained power to be wide, right? I think I just need my retained power to look like this, right? Um, I think. Uh, so basically when we come through here and we say source emit C uh, times retained power, I think maybe what I need to do is just say like, maybe just call this retained color, really. Um, <clears throat> and say that we just take the color that we had, the, 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 the light we had coming in, the literal value of it, right? Um, and when we do this retained power here, what we say is like, okay, actually what's going to happen is we're going to subtract retained color, uh, and the retained color value is going to be, you know, whatever we actually added, right? Uh, so the result here is the power times the light color, like so. We add that to our dest, and we return it to subtract it away from what we had, right? Um, does that help? Let's find out. Again, we get really far down before we start to really lose power but we still are losing a little bit of power. Um, so maybe we're close. I think it's probably, yeah, it's time. We're, we're supposed to be doing Q&A here, I think, in three minutes, right? <clears throat> we're not in Q&A, are we? Are we in Q&A? I don't know. Um, so that's a lot closer, right? So this way we start with what we had, right? We're then going to try to emit some of it. This is what we're going to try to emit. 
um, anytime we send light to someone else, we subtract that light from us and we no longer retain that. You know? Uh, that seems like it would work pretty well. It doesn't seem like that has a lot of holes in it. Uh, yeah. I don't think. So I think that may be more what we're going for here. <clears throat> uh, so let's take a look at our lighting samples. Right. Um, so uh, if I start out, there's our first bounce, direct lighting. There's our second bounce with some indirect, third bounce, fourth bounce, fifth bounce. That looks really nice and even. So I'm going to go ahead and call that victory for now because it really looks pretty good to me. Um, <clears throat> I would say. Uh, now the problem with it, of course, is that you can see the yellow, you can see the light shift because as these surfaces can only send out those values, their colors will shift uh, towards the complementary color of the color they send out, right? And that's not really what we actually want to record for purposes of like things that are in this area that don't happen to be that color, right? We want to use the light color um, that was incident on the light. So we almost really need like two, uh, like two values there, right? So I don't know, again, that this keeps the, this keeps the power quite well, but it's just not, not quite there. So I think we kind of need to sleep on this. We're pretty close though. I'll go ahead and go to the Q&A. You know, our main goal at this point is just going to be to start reducing the flicker, I think, and then we're getting pretty, pretty good. Pseudonym 73, Simulatorian, am I right in thinking that you're taking into account the geometric cosine theta factor on the receiving surface, but not on the emitting surface? Yes, you are correct in that thinking. Graga, in a trade like blacksmithing, you use your tools to make better tools over time. Do you think programming should be like this, where you build tools that you reuse every project, or should you build most of your code every project? Uh, I, so, I think it's not feasible to rebuild most of your code every project. I just don't think you can these days, right? I think rebuilding code, rebuilding the entire code base every project would be great in a world where you just had a team, your team had 30 amazing programmers on it and you just had tons of coding power and you just kept refining things. And, you know, the person who wrote the... Um, Entity system for last game writes a new one this game and a new one the next game and a new one the next game. It just keeps getting better and better. That would be a great world, right? Everything would just be great. But that's not reality 
right? Uh, that's not what you typically have. Uh, usually you don't have the ability to, uh, usually you just don't have the ability to rewrite everything. There's too much code and too little time, too few coding resources. Um, so I, I just don't think it's practical. I think you have to, you know, first time out, if you're doing a whole new code base, then yeah, you gotta write what you can write. But I think the next time out, you wanna only choose a few things to rewrite, the things that most need improvement, and try to keep the other things, if you have to make modifications to them, make them, but don't rewrite them. Because you don't want to be, you, you, your time is a finite resource and you need to focus it on where you can make the biggest differences. So um, rewriting everything from scratch every time probably just isn't the best choice there. It's probably better to focus your resources on doing a really good job on a few things and not um, spreading it out over all the things. So uh, at least for me, I try to limit the number of times I have to rewrite everything uh, because that's just a way too much programming, especially for a single programmer to do. Now, if you have a bigger team and lots of really good programmers at your disposal, that equation may change. Um, but that is just not very likely. Uh, plus, there are other ancillary concerns there, such as it sometimes is very hard to redo everything at once because you don't have any sticking point, right? Um, when you're going to do a new rev of an engine, sometimes it helps to keep the core of the old engine to have things that know how things will interact, right? Um, so it's not always possible to rewrite everything anyway in that sense. You may, it may be better the other way around. I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Sudum seriously, that may explain why it wasn't energy preserving. Uh, is that actually correct, though? I thought that on the emission side, you're not usually taking into account the angle. Plus, if anything, that would lose us energy, wouldn't it? More 85, could you explain the purpose of multiple pointer levels like void, star, 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 whatever? Is it just array of array of array of array? I can't think of a viable example. Can you give one? Of pointers to pointers? How many, can you be specific about how many levels deep you want an example? Like, is void star star also confusing to you? Or is only void star 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 confusing to you? Like, is it only when it gets to five that you're not sure what the example would be? MTS Mox, is the direction of light correctly calculated if you only take positive Z into account? Negative Z is also correct. No more. Oh, that's a very good point. That is a very good point, my friend. No, uh, we, thank you for catching that. Uh, we do need a sign here because this, um, not this. Uh, so this right here is technically positive or negative. You're right. Uh, so when we reconstruct this, we actually need to do that properly, right? And fortunately for us, we have a lot of extra information here at our disposal, which it just happens to be handy. Um, but for example, light color, what we can do is pack that into say the R value, right? Uh, so what we could do here is say, if light uh, C dot R is less than zero, light c dot r uh, equals negative light c dot r uh, and light d dot z equals negative light d dot z, right? So what we can do is encode the sign of z, which we don't know, unfortunately, at this point, right? Uh, we can encode that into the r value uh, and, and have our cake and eat it too, if you will. Uh, so inside render group here, let's go to platform. 
so in this light data, we will do like uh, sine dz times cr, right? Um, so when we pack that down, what we can then do is say, all right, that color value, uh, when we pack it in here, uh, what we can do is say that that's not the function. This is the function here. Uh, what we can do is say, all right, the sine of d dot z uh, will multiply that by the, the, um, uh, I don't know why we're still doing that pack out. There's no reason for it. Um, we will take that sign and we'll put it in there, right? Uh, all right, so that's, we don't have a sign function, so we'll just do if d dot z is less than zero, d dot z times equal, or equals negative d dot z, c dot r equals negative c dot r, right? So we just flip the sign of the red channel, um, and off we go. Uh, so that, that was just a straight up bug uh, with the light direction. Um, so thanks very much for that catch. That's like totally just me not thinking it through. In the case of the red wall only being lit by the third or fourth bounce, shouldn't the red wall not reflect any red light because the blue wall is mostly only reflecting blue light? Um, well, sort of, but not necessarily. The reason is because there's more than just that that's affecting the red wall. So like all of these surfaces can distribute light to the red wall, right? So like, for example, here, all of these can light this wall. So you don't actually need the blue wall to bounce. Does that make sense? Uh, if it was only the blue wall, then yes, uh, the red wall would never get lit at all if it wasn't indirect light. But it has these grays here. Oh, pseudonym service here is saying, yeah, but think back. The original problem was that the solution was blowing up. Um, well, yeah, the problem is the original solution uh, just constantly accumulated light, though, so it would blow up no matter what the light transfer was. You know what I'm saying? Um, because all it did was add light. It never had a way of removing light from the system at all. Uh, so you would always keep the light you had and add any light that came in. So that's going to blow up no matter what, right? Um, and we didn't try to do a version that only sent out exactly the same amount of light uh, because we don't have a way to do that. Since it's not a closed environment, we have to check to see whether we hit and only subtract that light away because we don't know how much will... Otherwise, all of it just goes out from the atmosphere, right? Um, at the moment, anyway. More 85, void star star is clear, everything above is bogus. Um, so star star star, so triple you'd say was bogus. Um, so you're basically saying void star star star. This is, this is the bogus part. Um, so basically, uh, you're asking if the address of the address of the address of a pointer, right, I guess, or sorry, the address of the address of a pointer. Um, and the answer, of course, is like, uh, you know, maybe so, maybe not. It depends. You could end up in this situation. So uh, what we're talking about here is we have a location that's got a pointer in it, right? Uh, so here's our void star, whatever it is. Uh, so this is the data <clears throat> that we're actually talking about here, right? Um, and so in this case, we may say, well, all right, let's suppose we had a system where we were modifying ones of these. So let's say there's just an array of pointers going down, right? 
that we're trying to modify. Well, all right, let's say we had a pointer here that points to the one that we're modifying right now. So maybe we're in a for loop or something, right? And now let's say we have a function that we do with this pointer that advances it. And maybe it advances it, it doesn't just go linearly, it advances by something. So we have an advance and it needs to take a void star star star, the pointer, right? And it's like, you know, uh, star a plus plus to like move this thing down or something, right? So it's advance, this is void star star a or something. And we say advance address of a, right? So you could imagine a case where three trip stars is not that bizarre, right? Student says, you just suggest the ultimate solution might be to use temporal coherence, do one bounce per frame, and use the previous frame solution uh, for the indirect lighting term. Yes, uh, that is almost certainly something we will do. The problem that we will have, and uh, we are going to have to figure out a good way to solve it, it's going to be nasty, is figuring out frame to frame what lighting samples correspond. Uh, and the reason for that is just because the environment we could match up probably by rote, but the sprites we can't. So, I don't know. We definitely need temporal smoothing anyway, but I'm not sure how we're going to do it exactly. Dark and Dario, two weeks ago I asked about sound input. I just want to specify that I was thinking about the data structure to store the sound input. So like you have it set up with the platform layer handling the sound input and passing it to the game. Uh, well, I think all you really have to do is the game just provides a buffer or the platform layer provides a buffer that's like, here's the sound I recorded last frame, right? That, that should be it, I think. All right, I'm gonna shut it down. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along the series, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. And it comes with a full source code, so you can uh, follow along at home. We also have a forum site you can go to if you want to ask questions. We have a contribution page if you want to donate to projects uh, that support Handmade Hero, like the episode guide, um, which is right here, uh, uh, or the Handmade Network, which uh, does the forums. There's also a schedule bot, which tells you when we're going to be live, uh, and a, if you refresh this page, a little countdown timer, which tells you when we're going to be live as well. Um, that's it for today. I'll be back tomorrow when we can try to uh, do a little bit more work with our lighting solution and uh, start to sort of narrow in on a good uh, final like approach we're going to use that we can uh, start to think about how we're going to accelerate. And uh, to the uh, pseudonym 73s point at the end of the stream, uh, how we might break that out into something that uh, is more coherent over time uh, and isn't doesn't require within a single frame us to cast the number of rays it would take to make it clean. Uh, so we'll be doing that tomorrow. Hope to see you back here for that. Until then, have fun programming, and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.